all rise. Please, everyone, be seated. I want to thank you for coming on such a short notice at such an ungodly hour of the night. The Republic will forever be in your debt. You might be wondering what you are doing here. As you all know, I ran for president and won on the platform of justice and fairness. At no other time in our history have justice and fairness been sorely wanting. And so the vast majority gave me their overwhelming vote of confidence. Some of you were my gracious supporters and party mates, as well as staunchest critics and bitter rivals. So I won't impose upon you to grant an obligation that I indeed bring forth justice and fairness. But this I ask of you, friends and foes alike, grant me this, that my government be just and fair. That when people look back at this year, this republic under this president was just and fair. And what better way to demonstrate this than deciding upon the fate of four people, two men and two women, found guilty beyond reasonable doubt by our court and sentenced to death by hanging. Unless I intervene, these people will die at 6 a.m. sharp tomorrow morning. And that is why you are here by the authority of the office of the president, I hereby order you, all of you, to give me your wise and judicious counsel. We barely have eight hours left before sunrise, so we must act on haste. The ruling of the Supreme Court just came earlier this evening, but before proceeding any further, let me quickly give you the facts. The four defendants and the deceased, Roy Wetmore, were parts of the Spelanchan Society. An amateur cave exploring group who were trapped in a cavern during a landslide. made the rescue difficult, time-consuming, and expensive. Ten men were even killed during the rescue as landslides still occurred every now and then. Early on, it was clear that death by starvation was imminent. day, the explorers were able to establish contact with the rescue team through some handheld communication device. The engineering chief of the rescue informed them that they would need 10 more days to clear the boulders at the cave's entrance. The medical chief chimed in and said that given their condition, Given your condition, Chances of survival for 10 more days would be a remote possibility. It was at this point that Roy, the leader of the group, first brought up the idea of cannibalism. Will there be a possibility of survival for us for 10 more days if we, if we consume the flesh of one of us? 
answer us doctor are we gonna survive for 10 more days if we eat human flesh mm, yes how are we gonna determine who to eat mm, i won't comment on that so get me a judge or a priest or minister of government to advise us on this matter hello 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 when the explorers were released it was learned that on their 23rd day inside the cave roy had been killed and eaten by his companions according to their testimony as admitted by the court it was their leader roy who proposed that they cast lots using a pair of dice that they happened to be carrying in order to determine who should be sacrificed. Initially, the convicts were reluctant but agreed to adopt this desperate measure upon hearing Roy's conversation with the rescue team. Before the dice were cast, however, Roy withdrew from the arrangement, claiming he would wait another week. The others charged him with a breach of faith and proceeded to cast the dice. Before throwing the dice on his behalf, the convicts asked Roy to declare any objections to the fairness of the throw. He did not object, and the throw went against him. Roy was put to death and eaten. After their rescue, the convicts were treated for malnutrition and shock, and then indicted for murder. The trial judge ruled that they were guilty of the crime and sentenced them to be hanged, as the language of our law admits no exception. Whoever shall willfully take the life of another shall be punished by death. They then brought a petition of error before the Supreme Court, where an equally shocking outcome emerged. With Justice Magdangal's abstention for his personal failure to resolve his doubts, the court was divided evenly, with Chief Justice Enriquez and Justice Marquez affirming the conviction, while Justice Rosas and Justice Flores setting it aside. With a two-on-two -two vote, the court all but ratified the conviction, which brings us here to the issue at hand. Whether or not, as President of the Republic, I should grant executive clemency to the inmates on death row. As you all know, granting of absolute pardon is a presidential prerogative. I could have done this without you, and no one will question whether or not I stay the execution. But here we are, because I want to stay true to my lifelong aspiration of fairness and justice. We are so done with the no-seeing legalism of lawyers and judges and justices. For all their worth, they were unable to solve the enigma that is this case. Now I call upon you, no longer bifurcated as friends and foes, 
but dearest peers to offer me your minds discuss philosophize on the issue so that at the break of day I may reach a most fair and just decision born out of your wise counsel the clock is ticking and no one will be allowed to leave this room until everything is resolved. My executive secretary will facilitate your deliberations. You need not worry about anything you say here as it will not be taken against you and will be covered by executive privilege. See you in the morning. Thank you. This meeting is now called to order. We will listen to everybody speak, after which you will cast your votes on whether or not pardon be extended to the convicts. This will gauge the consensus of the majority, thus lending sound advice to the President of the Republic. Pen and paper are provided for you to write your votes of yes or no. May I call on the first speaker, Ms. Recto? This is a dilemma of the highest order. All eyes will be on us, and history will not judge us kindly if we will bungle this up. It is imperative, therefore, that we don't get this wrong by taking things right. After all, I believe that statutes and decrees are only valid in so far as they conform to what is right. I dare say, in fact, that unless a law be right and just, it doesn't have the sway that compels obedience on the people. It neither affords rights and protection, nor exacts duties and obligations. Having said that, I manifest before this small council. I condemn in the strongest possible terms the killing of Roy, the unfortunate leader of the group who are now on death row. Though admittedly it was his idea, it was clear that Roy changed his mind regarding the random selection of sacrifice in order to save the rest. Roy was not a willing victim. No, Roy resisted, but he was forced into submission, coerced into silence by the very peers whom he himself empowered. This is no going about this any other way. What happened was plain, brutal murder. They deserved to die also, as per applicable law. But then again, I also state my firm and an unshakable opposition towards capital punishment. If we penalize killers with death itself, how different are we from the very agents whose crimes we categorically denounce and demand redress? A law must be right and just, otherwise it does not bind. The Romans had an old dictum for this, lex inusta non lex est. But how can a law be just and right if we seek and put to that four people who had been through a lot, who had had other people lay down their lives in order that they might live? If we kill these people, we'll squander away the very sacrifices of Roy and the rescuers who had died in the performance of their duty. We are making a mockery of this dissident's memory, and everything will be for naught. If only for this, we must ask the president for absolute pardon. We must ask the Congress to abandon the barbaric and uncivilized sentence of death. Ms. Recto has put forth here a bold proposal. Not only should this small council move for a presidential pardon, but should also ask Congress to abolish the capital punishment as well, believing that the sentence of death being an unjust law, should not have binding authority over the people. Points well taken, Ms. Recto. Now we will listen to another brilliant mind in Mr. Sanchez. My friends, 
I find it funny and yet sad that we have ever come to this. Openly assailing the validity of the laws of the Republic on account of rightness and justice. Or, as I see it, morality. Since when did morality become the foundation of our legal order? Huh? Oh, I remember when we were yet stuck in the puddles of the Dark Ages, when learnings were discouraged on account that too much of it would lead us straight to hell. But I tell you what, since civil society divorced itself from divine rights theorists and moralists, progress in the human condition picked up. We are where we are right now, the summit of civilization, if only because we have refused to let our moral and religious convictions govern the affairs of the Republic. And so why must we do things differently now just because we have right before us a moral dilemma? As far as I'm concerned, this is not a moral dilemma if taken on the perspective of posited laws. So we have a situation where one must die in order for the rest to be saved. Even the esteemed speaker before me admitted that there was no way of sugarcoating what transpired. It was nothing short of murder, she conceded. And must we, and must we temper the force of our law against murder just because we feel an uncontrollable need to pity or sympathize with the murderers? No, sir! I don't think so! She speaks of rightness and justice and yet proposes injustice by hinting at the selective application of the law. What of the families of Roy who lost a beloved just because there was a need of heroism even if he had manifested his dissenting position? What of the loved ones and relatives of the many convicts who had stood before the news and never came out alive? What shall we tell them? Our society has come a long way just because we have understood a little better now that for every action that occurs, there is an equal or equivalent reaction. My friends, justice demands accountability. We cannot just talk about rightness and justice and let some injustice lie because we are overcome by our emotion. The law may be harsh, but that is the law. Duralex said Lex. And until otherwise repealed by proper authorities, the laws must be, must be applied equally, justly, and uncompromisingly in order for society not to descend into chaos and anarchy. My friends, in the end, we can only give them our sympathies. But we can never compromise on the dispensation of justice. In response to Ms. Recto, Mr. Sanchez submits that it would be also an injustice should the Republic adopt a selective application of justice. He contends that justice demands accountability, and so part of the proper dispensation of justice is the uncompromising dispensation of justice. Thank you, Mr. Sanchez. Let us now listen to Mr. Socorro. Listening to Mr. Sanchez is like putting a lid on my chest. It weighs down on me. It suffocates me, making a breathing a difficult thing. If you think I am speaking figuratively, I am not. But then think about this. How hard was it to breathe when unmovable boulders blocks your only way to freedom? It as if you've been buried alive and you count the days until death finally mercilessly comes. In the meantime, frustration rises at every futile attempt of escape. Fear sets in, worry, depression, Crippling anxiety huddled around, making the cave crowded with just the thoughts of them. It is so easy to talk about justice and the uncompromising applications of the law, but a sentence in any criminal proceedings is never just if attending circumstances are decidedly left out in the equation. 
Has any of us here experienced hunger pangs so great that we could eat an entire horse in one setting? How long can a man go without food? Science says between 40 to 70 days for those who are fit. Day one without food, the body consumes with its main source of energy, which is sugar. And after a week, when the fatty acid reserves are gone, the body switches to protein, breaking down muscles in the process. After two weeks, the body begins to lose heart, kidney, and liver functions. Infections may also bring about death. Can you imagine the ordeal they went through after weeks without food? And it's not purely a physical thing, because equally if not more daunting is the mental thing. So in the interest of fairness and justice, let me ask my fellow advisors here, how would you have advised the group if you were one of them that gave? Will you truly say, hey, let's wait 10 more days before help comes? Or will you be the one to propose that you'll roll the dice and let fate decide who lives and who dies? It is a great injustice, therefore, if we allow the full force of our positive law governs the consequence of their actions. When our law, our republic, could only imagine in horror the things they went through just so they could stand accused before our courts. The presidential pardon is a unique exercise of our civilized justice. It is an admission that there are things that could go so wrong and they could look so bad, but they had to be resolved in a manner that escapes logic and defies the law because of that is the only way for society to continue living itself in peace. Mr. Socorro made a moving speech about the phenomenology of hunger and how it has driven the explorers to the unfortunate course of action they have taken. For him, hunger should have been considered by the court as a tending circumstance that mitigates or justifies the action. Thank you, Mr. Socorro. We will now move on to Mr. Manglapos. By now, dear friends, we have been totally desensitized by a constant barrage of argumentum ad misericordial, a fallacy that lavishes sympathy and pity by shamelessly cashing in on one's misery at the expense of reason. This is a detestable ploy. We must reject it at all costs. Lady Justice covers her eyes because she endeavors to be as impartial and as objective as possible in applying the law without letting the outside factors influence her decision. And the outside factors are what we're shoving down our throat. How can we clearly see when our eyes are wet with tears? The undisputed fact remains. Four people are convicted of murders and the law demands that their life be forfeited too. There is some degree of seriousness and religiosity even on how the law was framed. Whoever shall willfully take the life of another shall be punished unto death. This helps to remind us that running an affair of a just republic is a serious matter. Our lawmaking bodies did not promulgate statutes that could willfully be set aside as if playing a sports games and rules are bendable. Yes, and I do not pose any objection should the president decide to exercise her discretionary authority. But it is us who should exercise caution and discretion in advising the president not to grant such pardon. We have become the final guardians of society who runs the risk of accepting back into the fold Four convicted murderers who have gotten the taste of blood and flesh. If pardon is to be granted, let us recommend as well that we may be granted pardon because we become more and more predisposed, releasing into the crowd raging bulls who are, whose coats are soaked with blood. There is a reason why our criminal justice is harsh and unforgiving. It not only deter criminals, but also protects the site as well from having to deal with them ever again. Mr. Maglapus advises caution against the grant of presidential pardon because in his words, this small council has become the final guardian of society against these criminals. We respect your position, Mr. Manglapos. Let us now move on to Mr. Wezan. Being an opposition candidate during the last elections, 
I believe the president is punishing me by including me in this small council. The weight of deciding on the forfeiture or reinstatement of four lives is no easy task. That is why I believe the president is conveniently dodging responsibilities. If this thing backfires in the court of public opinion, we shall have become her scapegoats. Of course, she will lay claim to credit if by any stroke of divine illumination we shall have greed on the right course of action. Be that as it may, I hereby manifest my position by saying that this case has been decided by the judiciary. No less than the Supreme Court had spoken, and we should have stopped right there. If the brilliant minds of legal luminaries were unable to solve the present case given the unquestionable expertise, wealth of experience, resources, and time for deliberations at their disposal, what makes the president think that she can haphazardly convene an ill-composed body of advisors with the high expectations of advising her rightly on such a difficult case? Why is it that she appears ready so to submit to our spur-of-the-moment counsel and not defer on the judicious decision of the court? One thing has become clear to me as the night progresses. Ladies and gentlemen of this small council, let me tell you a sad truth. We are all set up for failure by the very president who promises justice, but doesn't have the guts to swing the sword. If I had to entrust this resolution of this extraordinary case to any or any institution, I would stand by the settled decision of the judiciary whose esteemed members alone had shown impartiality in tackling the issues. If we had to err, let us err on the side of the justices. Thank you, Mr. Wesman. It's almost time and we have one more member with us. Let us listen to Mr. Marcelo. This present case is the perfect illustration of how our legal and justice systems have become farcical. A source of mockery and travesty that favors the rich and the powerful, but unleashes its wrath on ordinary people. There is nothing here but conflict of interest. On the one hand, we have the law and the ideals it seeks to uphold and protect. But on the other, on the other hand, we have the ordinary people's plight caused by the loss of oppressive nature against their social class. We are not given the names of the four convicts awaiting execution. Do you have their names? Do you have? That is a telltale sign of how insignificant they have become in the eyes of our ideological systems. Would the loss be applied in the same vigor if, say for instance, a business mogul, a famous tycoon or a senator stands accused on the same charges? I don't think so. We like to quote our jurisprudence filled with ordinary people's names we haven't heard of. We like to make an example of the severity of our laws on the hapless and the helpless. And yet the powers that be all to willingly bend the rules for the rich and the powerful. Remember that senator convicted of 25 counts of statutory rape of at least three girls? And yet the former president happily commuted the sentence so that he was out of jail in less than the prescribed minimum period of detention. How about that young man from a wealthy, famous family that had roots abroad, convicted with his friends in the crime of rape and murder of their beautiful neighbors? He had just been extradited to another country where he was released five years into detention on account of good conduct, time allowance, and other similar means.
provided by their foreign law. The list can go on, but we don't have time for that, do we? What's at stake here are just not lives, but the lives of these ordinary people who belong to the silent majority. To advise, therefore, in favor of saving them. This is a form of social rebellion worthy of emulation in all corners of the Republic. Brothers and sisters, I now invite the President to join our cause and show once and for all that her authority which emanates from the people must serve, uphold, strengthen, protect and defend the government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Mr. Marcelo calls for a revolution by asking the President to grant pardon to the convicts since the law, by design, is oppressive against their social class. Now you have laid down your minds and cast your votes. It's time for the President to decide.